Jackie from Chronically Jackie, and this is my service dog, Harlow. I know this is a long video, but please bear with us and watch the first few minutes because I'm going to give out some important information. Within the United States, a service dog is a dog that has been individually trained to do work or perform tasks in order to mitigate their handler's disability. I'm not going to get into the schematics of service dogs because I already made a video that does that. It's called Service Dog 101. If you are interested in getting a service dog or want to learn more about service dogs in general, then that's the video for you and there's a link to it in the description. This video is dedicated to answering all the frequently asked questions I receive about Miss Harlow here. I'm not going to go over how I trained her to do the things she can do, but if you're interested, you can visit our training tutorial playlist. I'm also going to be mentioning several chronic illnesses and symptoms, and if you want to learn more about those, you can watch my chronic illness video, and there's a link to it in the description. Also in the description is a table of contents. I know it's a long video, and if you're looking for an answer to a specific question, the table of contents will tell you the exact time that question begins in the video, so you can go right to it. You don't have to watch the whole thing. If you're new to my vlogs and you just want to understand what's going on with the whole service dog situation, you'll just need to watch the marked sections in the table of contents. The description also has a ton of helpful links. If I happen to mention something like the Americans with Disabilities Act service dog FAQs, you'll most likely be able to find a link to it there. Please keep in mind that teams, which consists of a handler and their service dog, do things differently. Our training style, commands, tasks, and so on are very unique to us. We respect the choices of other teams and we just ask for the same courtesy in return. At the time of making this video, Harlow is just shy of being two years old and she is nearly done with her in training phase. But by the time you're watching this, she may be much older and completely done with her in training phase. It's a personal choice of mine as when I deem her to be completely done with her in training phase. But service dogs are never really done training because you have to keep up with established skills. and. There's always the opportunity to add in new skills, commands, and task work as the nature of my disabilities change. Now that we've gotten all that out of the way, let's get started. Harlow is a purebred golden retriever and I bought her from a professional breeder in Florida. Her birth date is June 28, 2015 and I brought her home when she was 8 weeks old. She is spayed and weighs roughly 70 pounds. I feed her a raw diet following BARF, or Biologically Appropriate Raw Fed, protocol. At various times throughout the year, Harlow will have an eye stain. It's due to seasonal allergies and doesn't harm her whatsoever. It's cosmetic, meaning it only affects the way she looks. Every morning, I use eye wipes that were recommended to us by a veterinary optometrist. They are all natural and have no chemicals, and yes, I did take my dog to a doggy eye doctor because I was concerned about her eyes and wanted to make sure they were okay. Turns out her eyes are perfectly healthy. Her main nicknames are Har, Harpo, and Hippo. Har is short for Harlow, Harpo is one of Dory's guesses at Nemo's name from the movie Finding Nemo, and Hippo comes from her love of food and water. Besides working, Harlow's favorite things to do are swim, play fetch, and be with me at all times, yet she has no signs of separation anxiety whatsoever, which is awesome. She is a medium energy dog, and she does get hyper sometimes, but as you can see, she also knows how to be calm, which is great. The best way to describe Harlow is a silly puppy who loves absolutely everyone and everything. She loves to receive attention, but when she's working, she is completely focused. is designed to mimic a dog's ancestral menu, mainly feeding raw meat. I follow BARF, or Biologically Appropriate Raw Fed Protocol. I feed Harlow raw meat, liver, other types of organs, and bone based on her weight and activity level. I also throw in fruits and veggies. There are a lot of different ways to do raw, so just keep that in mind. I never thought that I would personally do raw feeding because it was intimidating to me. But I've come to learn that it's really not all that intimidating. The hardest part about it for me is prep day, and that's where I prepare all of Harlow's meals for the coming week. It's hard for me because it's physically taxing, and I have to take a lot of breaks as it exacerbates my symptoms. But if I take my time with it and take as many breaks as I need, it's totally doable, and I usually only have to do it once a week. 
The only thing I'm going to discuss in this section about raw is why I do it and the benefits I'm seeing Harlow receive from her raw diet. If you want more info on raw specifically, you can look at the helpful links in the description. First, I'll start off with saying that feeding Harlow a raw diet is safe. I wouldn't give it to her if it wasn't going to be good for her. I started her on a raw diet while I was staying with friends for two weeks while Judd was away at training. My friend was feeding her service dog and training a raw diet and I saw so many benefits in her dog that I couldn't ignore them. So my friend helped me transition Harlow from kibble to raw and taught me the basics of raw feeding. Almost instantly I started seeing a lot of great benefits in Harlow. She had a shinier and healthier coat, Harlow's teeth were becoming much cleaner, she had more energy, Harlow was pooping less, and her poops were much smaller and less smelly because she was absorbing more nutrients. Also, she was shedding less, and I had no idea that would be a benefit of raw, but it was, and within two weeks of starting her raw diet, Harlow's shedding had drastically decreased. Also, Harlow has mild allergies to artificial meat flavorings. The only artificial meat flavor she can have is salmon, so all her kibble and treats prior to raw diet was salmon based, but since starting raw, her mild allergy issues of running eyes and itchiness every now and then has greatly decreased. She still has an eye stain from seasonal allergies, but that's not a totally big deal. I love raw feeding because there are no preservatives and I know exactly what Harlow is eating. Harlow also loves this food. I have never seen her so excited for a meal prior to starting her raw diet. Also, I've seen way too many benefits in Harlow to ever go back to kibble. Now, that's not to say that I judge others who feed their dog kibble. I respect the choices of what any dog owner wants to feed their dog. I'm just simply explaining why I feed raw and the benefits I've seen in Harlow since starting her raw diet. If you want to learn more about a raw diet, check out the helpful links in the description. I do all of Harlow's grooming and I'd say she is a medium maintenance dog. I brush her coat three to four times a week. I brush her teeth with doggy toothpaste one to two times a week. I dremel her nails down once a week and every two weeks we give her a bath unless we feel like she needs one sooner. I trim down her pants or her butt fluff and trim the fur in between her paws whenever I feel it's necessary and I've never shaved her. It's not recommended to shave a double coated dog like a golden unless it's for medical reasons of course. She loves to be brushed and she loves having her teeth brushed because the doggy toothpaste tastes really good to her. She's not a fan of having her nails dremeled or getting a bath even though she loves the water but she doesn't fight me on it whatsoever. She will behave very well throughout her nail dremel and her bath and of course I give her lots of love for tolerating both of them. She used to shed a lot, and don't get me wrong, she still sheds, but something that greatly decreased her shedding was switching her to a raw diet. I was shocked. I didn't know that raw diets would decrease her shedding, and I don't know if it works that way for every dog, but Harlow does not shed as much anymore since starting her raw diet. Something else we got to keep up with her shedding was a Roomba 980 robot vacuum. That was a big deal for us because vacuuming manually would cause me to pass out due to my pots. And so between the raw diet and the Roomba, keeping up with her shedding is totally doable and the Roomba especially was a good choice for us because vacuuming would make me pass out and so the Roomba was a really good choice due to my health. What made me decide to get a service dog in the first place? Well, I was 15 at the time, and like any teenager, I wanted independence, but my chronic illness was running rampant. My family and I were desperate, looking into all the different types of options, because traditional medication just wasn't working. At the time, I was only diagnosed with narcolepsy with cataplexy. It was my first chronic illness diagnosis. I was having trouble staying awake long enough to hold a simple conversation, I was having several sleep attacks a day where I would drop to the floor asleep without warning, I was having more than 20 full body collapses a day due to cataplexy. From all the falls I was having, I was sustaining injuries and I had to have a person with me at all times for my safety. At the time in my life where I was supposed to be gaining independence, I was completely disabled. As I mentioned, my family and I were looking into all different types of options in order to give me some relief from my narcolepsy, and I just so happened to look into service dogs. At the time, I didn't know that service dogs could help with all different types of disabilities, 
but after doing a lot of online research, I discovered that they could potentially be a huge help to my narcolepsy. So I gathered a lot of online articles and put them together in a binder and presented it to my parents. It took a little convincing, but eventually they also agreed that a service dog could potentially be a huge help for me. We also wanted my doctors to be on board, so we presented the binder to my narcolepsy doctor and my primary care physician, who both agreed that a service dog was an excellent idea. And from there, we made the choice to pursue getting myself a service dog. Basically, it was because we have tried all other options for treatment and nothing was working. This was our last resort to get a service dog, and I'm so glad we made the choice when we did. Although my narcolepsy is much more controlled now than it was in the past, I still struggle a lot with my other chronic illnesses that disable me. I'm so thankful we made the choice to start our crazy service dog journey when we did because without it, I wouldn't be where I am now with Harlow who helps me immensely with the disabilities I struggle with now. Harlow is not my first service dog. I've technically had three before her, but I don't really count the first one because I had no part in the dog's training and it was a disaster. I was 15, so young and naive. My family and I were desperate to find something to help me with my independence. We were brand new to the service dog world. We didn't do our research well and we rushed into an organization that sounded too good to be true. Unfortunately, it was. We were scammed by a Florida organization that gave us a very poorly trained German Shepherd. I call her the German Shepherd from hell. This dog would walk away when I passed out. She didn't listen to me whatsoever. And the worst part about this dog is that she would nip at people when they walked by, never drawing blood, but that was still an unacceptable behavior for a service dog and I couldn't safely bring her out in public. So. We worked with many private trainers to try and correct her behaviors over the course of about six months, but nothing was working and we eventually gave the dog back for retraining, but never heard from the organization again. If you're going to go with an organization, please do your research well. There are a lot of good organizations out there, but there are also a lot of scam organizations. Watch my Service Dog 101 video. I have advice regarding this. And if you watch my section about what happens after Harlow retires, you'll learn why I'm considering an organization if I need a service dog after Harlow retires. My next dog was Austin. He came from a Florida rescue at six months old and he was a lab mix. I consider him my first official service dog in training and this time my family and I did owner training while utilizing many professional trainers along the way. Austin was a wonderful dog, but unfortunately he just did not have the temperament to be a service dog, and I wasn't going to make him into something he was not, which was a service dog. He was very hyper and became overexcited and was just a very high energy dog. He was also dog reactive, and whenever he saw a dog, he would literally drag me to the ground in order to go say hello to it. The trainers I work with agreed that he just didn't have what it took to be a service dog, and that's okay. Not a lot of dogs have the right temperament to be a service dog. I made the very difficult choice to rehome Austin for two reasons. One, I couldn't keep up with the demands of his exercise needs. He was a very high energy dog and I couldn't compensate for what he needed exercise wise and it wasn't fair to him. My poor health just could not keep up with what he needed. Two, he was physically hurting me, literally dragging me to the ground on walks because he was very strong and very overexcitable. It wasn't his fault. I mean, he was a loving dog. He never hurt me intentionally, but he was still hurting me all the same. And for those two reasons, I decided we just weren't a good match for each other. And although I loved him, I knew finding him a better fitting family would be best for both of us. I was very picky in my search and finally found the perfect home that had an active couple, a pool, a fenced in yard so he could run in all day, and other dogs to play with. And now they also do agility with Austin sometimes because he likes to have a purpose and that gave him a great sense of purpose. So I think it worked out really well. My next dog was Oakley. He came from a backyard breeder in Florida and he was actually the dog I had previous to Harlow. He is a golden doodle and has such an attitude, but he did really well with his service dog training. Again with Oakley, I utilized many professional trainers. He did well throughout his training and finished around two years old. Unfortunately, a few months after his two year birthday, he developed arthritis in one of his back legs. It's a mild case that comes and goes, 
but I just don't think it's fair to make a dog work for you when they themselves have a painful medical condition. So I retired him early due to his health. Now he lives with my dad as a very spoiled and loved pet, and my dad only lives a few hours away from me, so I get to see Oakley pretty often. It worked out really well because my dad ended up having a stroke and Oakley was so good for my dad's recovery, acting as a good companion for him. He does not use Oakley as a service dog. Oakley does not do public access, but being home with my dad and supporting him through his recovery was excellent. So the journey to get here was kind of crazy. And after working with all those private trainers, I learned a lot from them from age 15 to 20. Now I feel confident enough to do Harlow's training all by myself. So like I said, the journey to get here was crazy, but I think it was all worth it to end up with my silly puppy that I have now. I knew I wanted a golden retriever for my breed because I wanted to make my life as easy as possible. Training a service dog while battling multiple invisible disabilities was already going to be hard enough, so from the research I did, I found that golden retrievers were very willing to please, had a good work ethic and work drive, were very trainable, grew large enough to be exactly what I needed for mobility, and I loved the way they look. I have never had a golden retriever before Harlow, but now I'm completely in love with the breed. I also knew that I wanted a female. There's no particular reason I wanted a female other than the fact that I just wanted one. And in Harla's litter, she was one of three females that I had to choose from. I take a lot of things from the Volhard temperament testing and then I use a lot of my own testing criteria too to temperament test the puppies. One of the females was way too skittish. The other female was way too hyper. And then there was one mellow, sweet, and kind puppy who was such an angel and that became my Harlow. Now, even though she passed all of my testing criteria so well, it did not guarantee her success as a service dog. No matter how well a puppy or any age dog does on a temperament test, it cannot guarantee their success as a service dog. There's no way to know for sure that any dog will make it as a service dog. But of course, I had a really good feeling about Harlow. And now that she's only a couple months shy of completing her service dog training, I am confident in her ability to be my service dog. What makes Harlow a service dog? Well, first let me give you a little background on the laws regarding service dogs in the United States. Within the US, a service dog is a dog that has been individually trained to do work or perform tasks in order to mitigate their handler's disability. They can be any breed and help with virtually any disability. Within the US, there is no such thing as a service dog registry, certification, identification, or a test they have to pass. There are scam websites that offer these things, but what they give you has no legal standing whatsoever and they are solely after your money. So what makes a service dog a service dog? Well, like I said, it's a dog that's been individually trained to do work or perform tasks in order to mitigate their handler's disability. So I know that may sound simple, but it's really not because training is extensive and it generally takes two years to properly train a service dog. Harlow is my service dog because I've trained her to perform tasks in order to mitigate my disabilities. That means she does things for me that I cannot do myself due to the limitations placed on me by my medical conditions. I am covered by the ADA or Americans with Disabilities Act federal law. It states that I have the right to have my service dog accompany me into the places where the general public is allowed. Movie theaters, grocery stores, restaurants, anywhere the general public may go, I have the right to have Harlow accompany me there too. There are only two questions businesses may ask me in order to verify that Harlow is a service dog. They are, is that a service dog required because of a disability? And what work or task has she been trained to perform? I always answer yes to the first one and medical alert or mobility to the second one. They cannot inquire about the nature of my disability or ask for any documentation on Harlow because there is no documentation on Harlow within the United States. There are a few exceptions to where Harlow can come with me and some examples include sterile environments like burn units and operating rooms and places of worship. That's because there's a separation of church and state, but every church I have gone to has always gladly welcomed Harlow and myself. For air travel, I am covered by the Air Carrier Access Act and Harlow comes with me on the plane and lays at my feet. For housing, I am covered by the Fair Housing Act. 
Allergies and a fear of dogs is not a permissible reason to deny us access to any establishment. If there is somebody in the business with a severe allergy of dogs, they must accommodate both parties. Generally in those situations, I just offer to be as far away from the person with the allergy or fear, and it has always worked out. A business can deny a team access if the dog is not under the handler's control and the handler does not attempt to regain control of their dog. However, the business must offer to provide services to the handler after they have removed their dog, and a business cannot deny a handler or a team access based on past experiences they've had with other different teams. If you want to learn more about the laws regarding service dogs, you can check out the link in the description that takes you to the service dogs FAQ from the ADA themselves. Have we ever been denied access? Meaning, has an establishment ever said, sorry, you can't come in because of your dog? Yes, I think it just comes with the territory of having a service dog. Thankfully, access disputes don't happen all that often, and when they do, I can usually politely educate my way through it by just having a conversation. I've rarely had to escalate to calling corporate levels and resolving the situation that way. I think my worst access dispute story has to be when I had the cops called on me. I was a regular at a bagel shop, and one day they just happened to have a new manager. I went in with my service dog, and the manager demanded to see my service dog paperwork, which, as I mentioned in the previous section, does not exist. I even pulled up the service dog laws on my phone, and the manager refused to look at it, so she called the cops on me. I waited an hour because I was going to stand there and resolve the situation with the cops, and the police never came because they have actual emergencies to attend to, which is totally understandable, so after the hour, I went to my car, fighting back tears of frustration because I just was denied my rights and was discriminated against, which is a terrible feeling. And I called a corporate level of that bagel shop and they were extremely apologetic. They sent like 36 bagels to my house as an apology and they did a mass re-education of service dog etiquette and laws to all of their locations. And that's all I wanna get out of these situations. I want people to be educated because I think the number one cause of incorrect access disputes is there's a lack of awareness of service dog etiquette and laws. Nowadays, I carry around a printout of the service dog FAQs that comes right from the Americans with Disabilities Act.gov website, and I use those in the really tricky situations where people are really stubborn about granting me access. When I show them the paper, I say, I do not have to give you this, I'm giving you this because you need to learn the laws. My biggest piece of advice for y'all in regards to how to handle access disputes as a handler is to know your rights. I know all of my rights on the ADA federal level and my Florida state statute level. Knowing your rights means you'll be able to advocate for yourself. So if you know your rights, you'll do great. In the United States, there are several ways you can go about getting a service dog. You can go with a program in which they fully train the dog for you and then place it with you. You can utilize professional trainers, or you can do all the training by yourself. If you wanna learn more about how to obtain a service dog, watch my Service Dog 101 video. I did all of the training with Harlow on my own, and it's often called owner training. It's a lot of work to do your own training for a service dog because you also have to push through your disabilities while training your service dog. I learned how to train by utilizing many professional trainers with previous service dogs, and after years of working with them, I felt confident enough to train Harlow all by myself. I use positive reinforcement training methods, and Harlow's main driving factors are praise and treats. Now that she's almost done with her in-training phase, we don't use treats anymore unless she's learning a brand new skill. Now we solely rely on praise. Harlow started her training right away when I brought her home at eight weeks old, but it wasn't anything like a crash course to shock her system. We took things slowly and first focused on building a bond between the two of us. And I also focused heavily on socialization at that young age and basic obedience. I wanted to lay a solid foundation in basic obedience. Of course, we only started with easy commands like sit, down, and watch me. As she became more potty trained, we threw in public access, but only after she received a certain set of shots and the vet deemed it safe to bring her in public. We started with dog-friendly places and only businesses that knew me very well and personally and welcomed Harlow and I. Then, as she grew and became more potty trained, we ventured into more non-pet friendly places and started with five minute outings, then 10 minute outings, 
and then so on and so forth. Basically, her training grew as she grew, and I never asked more of her than she could give me. I wanted to keep the training experience positive and fun and exciting for both myself and Harlow. That was very important to me. And I wanted to give her a lot of time to just enjoy being a puppy. As for task work and complex commands, I always made sure we worked those in when she was at an appropriate age to grasp the concept. Now that Harlow is nearly done with her training, I can really see that she loves to work. She is nearly two years old and works for me full time, meaning every time I leave the house, she comes with me too, and she loves her job. It's gonna be a personal decision of mine when I deem her to be done with her in training phase, and I think she's very close to being done with it. But service dogs are never really done with their training because you always have to keep up with established skills. You need to make sure they stay sharp with what they already know, and there's always the possibility of adding in new commands and tasks based on how my disabilities change over my lifetime. Does Harlow get to be a normal dog? Yes, she does. And the thing is, she gets more normal dog off-duty time than she does on-duty working dog time. One of the myths I'm really hoping to break by sharing my story is the whole poor service dog thing. They never get a break. That's just not true. I think a lot of people believe that because service dogs cannot be pet when they're out in public and working. And there's a good reason behind that. It's because they're focusing on their handlers and doing their best to keep them safe from their disabilities. Petting them can be distracting and that can be dangerous. But when Harlow's off duty, she can get love from anybody and she is a spoiled dog, trust me. When Harlow is home, she has access to all the toys she could possibly desire. We play tug, we play fetch, she has the zoomies, she gets belly rubs, she gets love from a ton of people. Harlow is a spoiled dog, she is well taken care of, and she's a big part of the family. And I'm pretty sure that is a universal thing among all service dogs. So she just does so much for me. You know, she gives me my independence back. I want to do my best for her and give her a happy life. Would you call this dog spoiled? Probably, but I have no shame in it. This is a happy, happy puppy. <laughs> Does the service dog vest signal a working mode to Harlow? Not exactly, but to a certain extent. Let me explain. Throughout Harlow's service dog training, when we did public access and other various training drills, I would have her do them in her vest. That's how she learned to associate working with her vest. Although service dogs are not legally required to wear a service dog vest or any type of gear identifying them as a service dog, I prefer her to wear them in order to let other businesses and people know that she is a service dog and she is on duty. It doesn't stop people from distracting her, but that is a whole nother story. Now, if we were in public and I happened to forget her vest or I just didn't want her to wear it for any particular reason, maybe the vest is dirty and I need to wash it, maybe it's raining and I don't want her gear to get soaked, then she would still behave just as well as she would if she were wearing the vest. The only difference is her working mode is automatic when she's in the vest. I just have to give her a command to get into working mode if she wasn't wearing the vest. Because when she's out and on the leash and she's not wearing her vest, she can have a loose leash walk, she can smell things, she can just be a normal well-behaved dog. But when the vest is on, she needs to be in a tight heel, she can't sniff whatever she wants, she needs to be focused and attentive. So if we were to go out without the vest, all I would have to do is tell her, finish. That is her command to get into a tight heel and she knows, okay, it's time to work. So the vest does automatically put her into a working mode, but I can still put her into that working mode with her finish command. Will Harlow still help me if she is off duty or not wearing her vest? Yes, she definitely will. When we are home, she doesn't wear her gear, obviously, but if I'm going to pass out from a pot syncope episode, she'll still give me an adequate warning. If I need help with something like picking up a dropped item, Harlow will happily do that for me and any other task I require of her in order to help mitigate my disabilities. One time we were at a dog park and Harlow was happily and rambunctiously playing with three other puppies. She suddenly stopped left them and came to me to warn me 10 minutes prior of a pot syncope episode. This goes back to the proper temperament of a service dog. Not a lot of dogs have it. And it's not just about training the dog in their tasks 
and in their duties. It's about the dog's desire to work. Whether the vest is on or off, it's about their desire to keep you safe no matter what. Something else that Harlow does is she'll wake up from naps and sleeping in order to alert me to incoming medical episodes. I don't know if that has anything to do with a dog's desire to work. I think that some dogs have that ability and some don't, and I'm just really thankful that Harlow does have that ability. She is always there for me. I never have to worry about her commitment to my well-being. She's really in tune to my health, and together we make a great team against the battle of my chronic illnesses. Does Harlow enjoy being a service dog? Well, do ya? Yes, I can honestly say that Harlow loves being a service dog, but I will also admit that being a service dog can be very stressful. That's because these dogs must remain calm, cool, and collected in all types of crazy environments in order to remain focused on their jobs. Dense, intimidating crowds, weird noises like fireworks, riding on planes and buses, they must be able to tolerate things like that so they can stay focused and help their handlers. That's why only a very small percentage of dogs can handle the job and do so happily, and Harlow is definitely one of those dogs. She is at her happiest when she's actively working for me. Now, when we're out in public and she's working, she may look bored or sad, but that's just not true. She's actually just very focused and attentive to my needs because she wants to know exactly what she needs to do in order to help me with my disabilities. If she were overly excited and hyper, she wouldn't be very focused, would she? So yes, she loves her job, and the reason behind that is because dogs are pack animals, and they have a strong desire to serve their pack. By helping me, I'm giving Harlow a great sense of purpose, and she's giving me independence in the prime of my life. So together, we make a wonderful team. Do people try to distract Harlow? Yes, of course they do. All service dogs at one point or another have to deal with distractions from the general public. That's why all service dogs are highly trained to ignore all types of distractions. Some people are downright rude and obnoxious, but what I've found is that most people just don't realize what they're doing when they distract a working dog. I tell people to treat service dogs as if they are wheelchairs. That means you wouldn't ask to touch the dog, stare at the dog, or ask the handler why they have the dog, and so on, because you wouldn't do these things to a wheelchair either. Now, I know these things can happen to a wheelchair, because sometimes I have to use a wheelchair too, but generally when I explain it this way, people get the message. Service dogs are considered medical equipment, spoiled and well-loved medical equipment, but medical equipment all the same. So just like a cane or a walker or a wheelchair, they are there to serve a very important medical purpose. They often have very life-saving duties, and although service dogs are trained to ignore all types of distractions, why make their job any harder? And it's not just the dog either. When people try to distract Harlow, she can ignore them completely, but I often become uncomfortable. People don't realize that I'm not bringing Harlow in public to draw attention to myself, but rather so I can be independent, even with the limitations placed on me by my disabilities. People often don't realize that just because I look healthy doesn't mean I am healthy, and it doesn't mean I'm training Harlow for somebody else. They may not realize that they're the 12th person to stop me and ask that same exact question that day regarding my dog or my health. They may not realize that I'm pushing through multiple symptoms given to me by my chronic illness and I may not feel well enough to chat. So although I try my best to spread awareness and teach people about proper service dog etiquette, sometimes it's just not feasible because I'm not feeling well. Y'all would be shocked at what people have done to Harlow while she's working. They have called to her, made those horribly annoying kissy noises, pulled her tail, pulled her ears, grabbed at the leash, the leash, mind you, which is often wrapped around my waist. Parents have told their children to go play with Harlow without acknowledging me, which is dangerous because those parents don't know how Harlow reacts to kids. Harlow is fine because she loves kids, but the parents don't know that. People have tried to feed her random food. People have even crawled under my table at restaurants in order to play with Harlow. The list is endless and it gets bizarre what people do to a service dog sometimes. People also pet Harlow without asking. Despite her wearing a vest that marks her as a service dog that is on duty, it says do not distract, do not pet, doesn't matter what you put on your service dog, people are going to interfere with them. Harlow is trained to ignore people who call to her or make kissy noises. If somebody pets her without permission, she continues to work. If somebody offers her food, she ignores it. She's generally very, very good at staying focused while she's working. Also, the 
odd encounters as I refer to them, such as somebody accidentally stepping on her, somebody pulling her tail, yanking her leash, a child screaming in her face, Harlow will look to me for guidance. She'll offer me eye contact so I can direct her on how to handle the situation. Service dogs must tolerate whatever the general public does to them, and Harlow has been trained to do so with happiness and confidence, because no matter how much I try, I cannot intercept every child that's going to run up and wrap their arms around Harlow. I cannot intercept every person who's accidentally going to step on one of her paws. I do my best, but it's impossible to intercept everything, and as a service dog, she must be calm, cool, collected, confident, and happy in anything that might happen to her. And so far in her training, she's proven to be a very good dog at doing so. Now, Harlow does have a greet command in which I give her permission to go greet strangers and get love from them. It doesn't happen very often anymore, but Harlow has proven time and time again that she will willingly leave those people to come back to me and alert to impending medical episodes and help me with my disabilities because she has a desire to keep me safe no matter what. But the way I see it is, why risk it? When we're out in public and she's working, I don't want to risk her getting so distracted to the point where she misses an alert or can't perform her job as well because she's distracted. Plus, it's just common courtesy. People like to be left alone to focus on their work. Harlow likes to be left alone to focus on her work. Common courtesy type of thing. Also, service dogs are not robots, and mistakes can happen. When a service dog is actively being distracted, the risk of a mistake happening increases. So that is why I don't want Harlow to be distracted in public. But when distractions do occur, she's very good at ignoring them. I do my best to spread awareness about proper service dog etiquette. And whenever I go out with Harlow, I do my best to be a good representation for the service dog community. Maybe somebody I'm meeting has never had any interaction with a service dog team before, and I want to leave a good first impression. But I also need to worry about myself, my health, and my service dog. So whenever we're out in public together, I do my best to find a good balance between public education and taking care of myself and Harlow. Does Harlow make mistakes? Well, service dogs are still dogs. They're like us, like humans, living, breathing creatures. One of my favorite sayings is service dogs are not robots. So yes, mistakes can happen. Harlow made a lot of mistakes in her earlier in-training days, and we always made a point to learn from them. Nowadays, Harlow really doesn't make any mistakes, but when she does, it generally consists of her giving in to somebody relentlessly calling to her while she's working, because Harlow is a social dog and loves attention. If that happens, all I have to say is, uh-uh, Harlow, leave it, and she's good. But service dogs are unique in themselves. They have their own personality, their own attitudes, their own quirks, and they're not robotically programmed to behave 100% perfect all the time. So yes, mistakes can happen. And generally, handlers are more critical of their dog's performance than other people. Sometimes Harlow has an off day with work, and when that happens, I'm usually the only one who can tell. The general public still sees her as a really well-behaved dog. Also, service dogs can just randomly get sick, too. My last service dog, Oakley, was feeling perfectly fine, behaving perfectly normal the entire day, and we went grocery shopping. In the grocery store, he suddenly puked. Wasn't my fault he puked, wasn't his fault he puked. He's a living, breathing creature. He can get sick sometimes. A lady came up to me and said, that's not a real service dog. A real service dog would never puke in public. Excuse me, obviously what she said made no sense because He's a dog, he can get sick. A coworker happily helped me clean it up and I took Oakley home for the day. So service dogs are not robots, they can make mistakes, they can get sick. That's why I'm so transparent about how Harlow is doing and her training and performance because I wanna break that myth and show that service dogs, while they are very well trained and well behaved in public, they're living, breathing creatures too, with their own little funny quirks and personalities, and mistakes are possible. So yes, Harlow does make mistakes sometimes, but like I said, they're not totally often anymore. Sometimes I get asked, what if I see you and Harlow in public? Can I come say hi even though Harlow is working? I cannot speak for any other team, but as for Harlow and I, the answer is yes. I would love it if y'all would come say hi to us. I just ask that you keep a few things in mind. One, let us know 
that you're hearing our story either from YouTube or Instagram because I think it is so neat when I meet people who are hearing my story, helping me spread awareness, helping me reach my goal of letting the world know about chronic illness and service dogs. I would love to know that I'm meeting one of y'all face to face. Two, I'm a person first and a service dog handler second. So that just means to completely ignore Harlow because that will also allow her to focus on her job and just talk to me solely. Three, depending on a few factors, the main one being how I'm physically feeling, I may or may not allow Harlow to greet you. And four, depending on how I'm feeling, I may or may not be able to stay in chat. If I can't stay due to my health giving me issues, I apologize in advance, but if you follow my story, I'm sure you can understand that. I'm not trying to be rude, I just have to listen to my body when it demands attention. So yes, if you see us in public and would like to, please come up and say hello. I honestly would love to meet the people who are helping me share my story and spread awareness to the world. I think that would be so incredible. What happens when Harlow retires? Well, service dogs typically do not work their entire life. Like humans, they eventually reach an age where working is just no longer comfortable or feasible for them. Harlow, I'm hoping, can work until she's eight years old, but she may need to retire well before that, or she may be able to work well beyond that. I just have no way of knowing. It depends on a few things like her health and how it holds up and how her temperament holds up. Who knows, she could become a grumpy old lady by the time she reaches six years old. I just have no way of knowing. Unless she becomes suddenly ill, which is unlikely because she comes from healthy lineage, I plan to phase out her working very slowly. So instead of taking her out 100% of the time, I'll bring her out in public with me 90% of the time, then 80%, 70%, and so on and so forth until she's no longer going out in public with me. I do this to be fair to her, because although she has no signs of separation anxiety, and I could leave her at home at any point and use a service human, and she'd be totally comfortable with that, this job of being my service dog gives her a great sense of purpose, and I don't think it would be fair to suddenly take it away from her. When Harlow fully retires, she will be staying with us as a happy and spoiled family pet. Not that she isn't happy and spoiled now. Because she loves to work, she will most likely continue to help me around the house, doing whatever is feasible for her, but I'm going to let her do that on her own accord so she can enjoy a leisurely and lazy retirement. I am so thankful that I began Harlow's training when I did, because since then, my health has greatly declined. I do not have the capability to own or train myself another service dog. So depending on how my health progresses, if I need another service dog after Harlow and I don't have the ability to own or train, I'll be looking into programs. But don't worry about Harlow. She is so much more than just my service dog. She is a big part of the family. So even when she's done working and fully retires, she's not going anywhere. Harlow do any cool tricks? Well, first, in regards to service dogs, it's important to know the difference between a command and a task. A command is a useful skill that a dog has been trained to do, such as sit, down, stay, and so on. A task is something that a service dog has been specifically trained to do in order to mitigate their handler's disability, and it directly relates to the handler's disability. For example, Harlow has been trained to pick up dropped items when I'm unable to do so myself. This section is dedicated to Harlow's commands. I'm not going to go over how I train her to do the things she can do, but if you're interested, you can visit my training tutorial playlist. I like to keep Harlow's mental skills sharp by teaching her new things like commands and tricks, and Harlow really enjoys it. She loves to absorb new information. Of course, she has a solid foundation in basic obedience, just like every service dog should. Sit, down, stay, stand, come, etc. She also is very good at body awareness. Did you know that dogs are not initially aware of their hind legs? You have to teach your dog that they have hind legs through rear end awareness exercises. That's exactly what I did with Harlow. And now that she has full body awareness, we can move through crowds more efficiently, tight places more efficiently, and it plays into her service dog work every day because she has a much tighter heel, and now we move more cohesively as a team. It's awesome. Some of Harlow's commands transition into her task work. For example, Teaching her to tug on command later transitioned into her learning to tug open the fridge in order to retrieve me bottles of water when I need them. Some of her 
tricks and commands are just fun and I teach them to her for no other reason just to be a cool party trick and keep her mental skills sharp. I cannot fit all of her commands and tricks into this section by no means because she just knows so many, but here's a quick compilation of some of my favorites and some of the basics. help me? Well, first I need to go over the difference between a command and a task. A command is something that any dog has been trained to do, such as sit, down, stay, and so on. A task is something that a service dog has been specifically trained to do in order to mitigate their handler's disability, and the task directly relates to the handler's disability. This section is dedicated to Harlow's task work, and although we can't go over all of the things she does to help me with my disabilities, we're going to go over the main ones we use as a team. Remember that we may be actively working on tasks as I'm making this video, and we always have the opportunity to add new task work into Harlow's repertoire as the nature of my disabilities changed. It's just whatever I need in order to stay as independent as possible. Harlow is a medical alert, medical response, and mobility service dog. Medical alert means she gives me a warning prior to medical episodes happening. She gives me about a 15 minute warning before I faint from a severe POTS syncope episode. She also gives me about a 15 or 20 minute warning before I drop to the floor asleep from a narcolepsy sleep attack. Because I get a warning from her, I'm able to get to a safe place before the episodes occur. No more injuries sustained from falls, which is awesome. These are considered natural alerts, meaning that they cannot be trained and the dog must be able to pick up on them by themselves. When Harlow was very young, I noticed she would have odd behaviors prior to me having one of these episodes. She would get very agitated, get in my face, smell my breath, and I realized she was exhibiting alerting behavior. So I shaped that behavior into her current alert cue, which is a nose bump. So now she tells me I'm gonna have one of these episodes by nose bumping my leg or stomach repeatedly. While I'm asleep or unconscious, Harlow has been trained to just lay calmly beside me. It's not good for my body to be woken up prior to me going through the episode. That's why I haven't trained her to wake me from my episodes. Instead, she lays calmly beside me because having her rouse me when I'm not ready to wake up would do more harm than good. Since I stopped having seizures before Harlow was even born, we have no opportunity to know if she would alert to seizures too. But just because she alerts to my narcolepsy and POTS episode does not mean she would alert to anything else either because, for example, she doesn't alert to my migraines. Since these are natural alerts, I have no idea what dogs pick up on, or Harlow even, to alert to my incoming episodes. But if I had to guess, I would say it's some type of scent my body gives off prior to an episode happening. Medical response means that Harlow takes actions when a medical episode is actively happening. 
I have something called angioedema attacks and they can become very dangerous. One of the first signs of these attacks is I'll get bright red rashes on my arms and chest. When I scratch at these rashes, I'm often not aware that I'm doing so due to the brain fog that comes with the attacks and a level of unawareness I have due to my autism. I've trained Harlow to nose bump me and break apart my hands when I start scratching. That way she makes me aware that I have began an angioedema attack. The sooner I'm aware I've begun an attack, the sooner we can administer my emergency medication, and the sooner we administer my emergency medication, the more likely it is to work. After the rashes, I usually begin to cough. During the day, we are generally already aware that I've began an attack when I reach that stage. But during the night, I tend to sleep through my attacks because I'm a heavy sleeper due to my narcolepsy. Judd is usually in bed with me, and so he'll hear me start coughing and help me with my emergency meds and wake me up. But sometimes he can't stay here at night and has to work overnight due to his job, so I'm sleeping alone, which can be dangerous. That's why I trained Harlow to wake up when she hears me coughing and will jump on the bed to wake me up and make me aware that I began an attack. That way we can administer my emergency medication and she's already proved to be very good at that and has quite possibly saved my life doing that exact task. If I'm in public and I'm having an angioedema attack or for whatever reason I'm down, need help and cannot speak, Harlow has a speak command with this hand signal where she'll bark. That attracts attention no matter where you are because a dog barking in, say, Walmart is not very typical. So people will come to see us and then they will help us. It helps us at home too because if Judd is downstairs and I'm upstairs and Harlow barks, he knows something is wrong because other than that, she's a very quiet dog. Medical alert and medical response both require something called intelligent disobedience. That is where a service dog will break a generally followed rule or command in order to perform their task. For example, Harlow knows she is not allowed on the bed unless we invite her up. But as soon as she hears me coughing from an angioedema attack, she will jump on the bed to wake me regardless of that rule. She will also break down stays I put her in in order to come alert me to incoming medical episodes. She also wakes up from napping and sleeping to alert to incoming medical episodes. She's just a clever pup that wants to keep me safe. Mobility means that Harlow helps me with the physical limitations that derive from my disabilities. Bending over has to be one of the most difficult things for me to do. Whether it's my chronic joint pain, my dizziness, my extreme fatigue or weakness, extreme nausea, lots of things prevent me from picking up items off the floor. And in certain cases, the postural change can cause me to faint. That makes it very dangerous for me to do the simple task of picking up items from the floor. So Harlow does retrieval for me in which she'll happily get whatever item I need from a lower shelf on the store, from the floor, whatever it may be. And this has to be one of our most used tasks. And this can transfer to other task work too. Cleanup is one of those tasks that derives from retrieval. This is where Harlow will pick up and gather different things and put them in a designated basket. She does this with things like her toys, which she scatters all around the house, with socks in the sock drawer, and laundry. This is extremely helpful to me because as I mentioned earlier, bending down to pick up dropped items can be very difficult for me and at times very dangerous. Sometimes my symptoms become so severe that I become stuck on the couch or in bed. Maybe I'm extremely dizzy to the point where taking a few steps would result in me falling to the floor. Maybe my POTS is flaring so bad that the act of just sitting up causes me to faint. Maybe I have subluxed my hip again or dislocated a few ribs again and I'm in such an immense amount of pain that moving just isn't feasible. When this happens, Harlow has a few tasks to help me even though I can't move from the couch or my bed. She has been trained to retrieve me a blanket from the blanket basket so I can stay warm and she can also bring me a water bottle out of the fridge so I can take my pills on time, which is very important, and stay hydrated. Sometimes I am physically limited on a very broad level, especially when I require my walker or a wheelchair. Harlow helps in those situations by opening and closing drawers, doors, cabinets, the fridge, the dishwasher, and so on. Sometimes I also lose dexterity and sensation and usefulness in my hands due to nerve issues from my Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or cataplexy from my narcolepsy. When my hands become useless, it's very difficult for me to hold things. So Harlow has a hold it command in which she can hold various items for me while we're out and working or around the house. 
In those situations where my hands become useless, it can also be very difficult for me to dress and undress myself. So Harlow helps with that by doing a few tasks and one of her favorites is socks off because for whatever reason, this dog loves to play with my socks. Some task work requires you to wait until the dog reaches a certain level of physical maturity. That's just so you can keep their joints safe. At 18 months old, my vet cleared Harlow to really start conditioning for these tasks because her joints were excellent and her growth plates had fully sealed. The two tasks are counterbalance and bracing. Counterbalance is where I pull up on the vest pull strap and Harlow will move her body weight in the opposite direction, allowing me to stabilize myself as I walk alongside her when I'm feeling dizzy or weak and so on. Harlow is still conditioning for this task and has not yet fully learned it, but throughout her early training days, I have always gotten her used to feeling an upward sensation on her vest. It wasn't until her vet cleared her at 18 months that I started to add weight and we're slowly adding more and more. I think this is going to be an excellent addition to her task repertoire. Bracing is where I support myself on Harlow and she will lock herself in place in order to allow me to do so. Never brace in the middle of your dog's back because that can really harm them. We didn't start conditioning Harlow for this until she was cleared by my vet and at the time of making this video she is still conditioning for this task. This is going to be very useful for severe asthma attacks, cataplexy attacks, angioedema attacks, dizzy spells, any time where I have trouble supporting myself. I personally feel that bracing should be momentary. If for any reason I find that I need long-term support, I will use my walker or wheelchair and not Harlow. Nonetheless, I think that this is going to be a very useful task for Harlow and I as a team. Harlow also does something called deep pressure therapy, and that's where she applies her weight and body heat in specific ways that I've trained her to do in order to alleviate my chronic pain. If my joints or muscular pain suddenly become very intense out in public, I can sit on the floor and Harlow will apply herself with deep pressure therapy in order to help me get through it. It's like she's the giant heating pad that goes with me everywhere. I also use deep pressure therapy very rarely for my autism. If I'm having a very hard time due to overstimulation, deep pressure therapy will also help me with that. So here is a quick compilation of just some of the task work Harlow helps me with in order to mitigate my disabilities. Again, we can't fit everything she does in here, but this is some of our favorites. changed my life. Harlow has immeasurably improved my life. She has filled it with love 
and hope and compassion. She is always with me. She stays with me through everything, the good and the bad, every doctor's appointment, every procedure, every hospital stay. Because of her, I can take a shower independently without having another person stand by the door waiting for me to pass out. Because of her, I can leave the house by myself and only need my service dog, not another human, service human. <laughs> because of her, I can pursue a college education and one day a career. Sometimes my health does fluctuate and my independence will fluctuate with it, but I will always have more independence with Harlow than without Harlow. She gives me love knowing that sometimes I'll fail because my chronic illnesses do hold me back no matter how much I try to not let that happen. And she shows me that it's okay to forgive myself and to love myself despite all that I go through. She is unconditionally loving. And you know, she gives me the sense of confidence to know that I will never be alone in my fight. So Harlow has changed my life for the better and there's nothing that I wouldn't do for this dog because I know there's nothing that she wouldn't do for me. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it and I really hope I answered all the questions you had regarding little Miss Harlow here. Don't forget there are a lot of helpful links in the description and there's a table of contents there too. Thank you so much for watching. By doing so, you've helped us reach our goal of spreading awareness for chronic illnesses and service dogs alike.